Hello, my name is Ken Schachter, and welcome to the F28 377S Launchpad Technical Overview with a demonstration of PWM modulation. In this presentation, I will cover a technical overview of the F28 377S Launchpad. The technical details of the Launchpad will be explored while demonstrating PWM generation and ADC reading both which are common to most all control applications. This will help reinforce the understanding of the features included on the launch pad. Additionally, various features of Code Composer Studio will be highlighted such as real-time emulation mode and displaying waveforms in a graph window. Specific information and support for the launch pad can be found in Control Suite. First select Development Tools, then C2000 Launchpad, and finally Launch XL-F28377S. The Launchpad incorporates an XDS100 V2 emulator as shown on the left side of this diagram. The USB mini connector located in the lower left corner provides a JTAG communication link between the device and Code Composer Studio in addition to supplying power. Jumpers JP1 and JP2 can be removed if electrical isolation is required, however the device will then need to be powered externally through the booster pack headers. The booster pack headers are located on J1 through J8. LED D1 illuminates when power is applied to the launch pad. User programmable LEDs D9 and D10 are connected to GPIO 12 and GPIO 13 respectively. The device is located in the center of the launch pad and push button S3 is connected to the device reset line. Jumpers JP4 and JP5 connect 3.3 volts and 5 volts to the booster pack headers J5 and J7 respectively. Interfaces to the CAN and QEPs are located on the right side of the launch pad. The boot modes are set by switch S1. Details about the boot modes will follow on the next two slides. When the device is reset, the peripheral interrupt expansion block, also known as the PI block, and the master interrupt switch INTM are disabled. This prevents any interrupts during the boot process. The program counter is set to 3FFFC0 where the reset vector is fetched. In the boot code, the JTAG test reset line or TRST line is checked to determine if the emulator is connected. If the emulator is connected, then the boot process follows the emulation boot mode flow. In emulation boot mode, the boot is determined by the EMU underscore boot control register located in the PIRAM. Specific details about the boot flow are then determined by the EMU underscore key and EMU underscore B mode fields in the EMU underscore boot control register. If the emulator is not connected, the boot process follows the standalone boot mode flow. In standalone boot mode, the boot is determined by two GPIO pins and the Z1 and Z2 boot control register located in the OTP. Specific details about the boot flow are then determined by the OTP underscore key and OTP underscore B mode fields in the Z1 and Z2 boot control register. Boot mode switch S1 contains three individual switches. Position S3 is connected to the JTAG TRST line. For emulation boot mode, that is when communicating with the debugger, this switch must be set to 1. The other switch settings are for standalone boot mode. In our demonstration, while in emulation boot mode, a CCS script will be used to set the boot mode to M0 RAM by populating EMU underscore key to 5A and EMU underscore B mode to 0A. The three main LEDs that we will be concerned with in this presentation 
are D1, which indicates the launch pad is powered on, and D9 and D10, which are connected to GPIO 12 and GPIO 13, respectively. The demonstration will be using LED D9 as a visual indicator to show the ADC ISR is running. In the GPIO.C file, GPIO 12 is set as an output and initially turned off. In the default ISR.C file, GPIO 12 will be toggled at a rate of 1 Hz so that the slowly blinking LED D9 can be seen. The launch pad includes a series of booster pack plug-in module connectors which follow the TI booster pack pinout standard. During this demonstration, we will use a jumper wire to connect the output of EPWM3A located on header J2 pin 19 to the input of ADC in A0 located on header J3 pin 27. The GPIO structure consists of setting a GPIO group MUX in addition to a GPIO MUX. Referring to the data sheet as shown in the top of this slide, EPWM 3A is located on GPIO 4 with a MUX setting of 01 and a group MUX setting of 00. These settings are configured in GPIO C as shown at the bottom of the slide. In this demonstration, EPWM3 will be configured to generate a 2 kHz PWM waveform with an initial 25% duty cycle. The output of PWM3 will be fed into the input of ADC A in 0 using the jumper wire. The ADC will be triggered at a 50 kHz sampling rate using EPWM2. In the ADC interrupt service routine, a circular buffer will be managed. GPIO 12, which is connected to LED D9, will be toggled at a 1 Hz rate and the PWM waveform will be modulated. The code will be running in real-time emulation mode and a Code Composer Studio graph window will display the waveform. In main, the CPU, ADC, and EPWM will be initialized. After initialization, the CPU enters an endless loop waiting for an interrupt from the ADC. In this demonstration, a symmetrical 2 kHz PWM waveform with an initial 25% duty cycle will be generated using a 100 MHz time-based clock. As can be seen in this figure, dividing the PWM period by the time-based clock period, a full cycle requires 50,000 clock ticks. Since a symmetrical waveform is being generated from the up-down counter, the period register value is set to 25,000. For an initial 25% duty cycle, the compare register is set to 18,750. In the ADC interrupt service routine, the ADC result register is read and the values are managed in a 50-point circular buffer. Also, a section of code will be used to modulate the PWM waveform between 10% and 90% duty cycle. Code Composer Studio is an integrated development environment which supports all TI embedded processor families. It consists of a suite of tools that integrates the editing, code generation, and debugging into a single graphical user interface. It operates free without any restrictions when used with the TI XDS 100 JTAG emulation based products such as the C2000 Launchpad and it is based on the Eclipse open source software framework. In the next few slides, I will explain how to build a project for the demonstration code from scratch. Then, I will run this project on Code Composer Studio using the F28 377S Launchpad as the target system. When using Code Composer Studio with a hardware system, a target configuration file needs to be created. Selecting File, New, Target Configuration File will open a window for setting the file name. After selecting Finish, another window will open for selecting the connection type and device. Clicking Save saves the target configuration file. Next, a new project needs to be created. 
Selecting File, New, CCS Project will open a window for creating a project. In this window, the project name, location, and device is selected. Under Advanced Settings, the link of command file is set to None since I will use the one that I have created for this project. For the project template and examples, I will select Empty Project since I have created the source code. This project will make use of the F2837XS peripheral register header files. These header files can be found in Control Suite under Device, Delfino F2837XS, and then Supporting Libraries. Next, we need to include these header files in the project. The project build options are set by selecting the properties for the project. In the Compiler Include options, the Pound Include search path for the peripheral register header files and the user header files are set and saved. Now the demonstration will continue using Code Composer Studio. In Code Composer Studio, I will click the Build button and we will see the tools run in the console window while watching for any error messages in the Problems window. The project built successfully. The Debug button will automatically open the debug perspective, connect and download the code to the target, and then run the program to the beginning of the main function. I will now click the Debug button. Notice the edit perspective changed to the debug perspective and the debug window shows the target is connected. We are now at the beginning of the main function. Since the emulator is connected, using the script I will set the EMU underscore key and EMU underscore B mode bit fields in the EMU underscore boot control register so that the F28377S will boot to the memory block M0 RAM. I will set the memory browser window to the address of the beginning of the circular buffer ADC buff. Now I will run and stop the code and watch the memory browser window load with the ADC values from the 2 kHz PWM waveform. Next, I will open a graph window to display the 2 kHz 25% duty cycle PWM waveform. I will set the data type to 16-bit unsigned integer, the sampling rate to 50 kilohertz, the start address to ADC buff, the display data size to 50, and the time display unit to microseconds. Now, I will run the F28377S in real-time emulation mode and enable the graph, memory browser, and expression window for continuous refresh. While running in real-time emulation mode, I will remove and replace the jumper wire between the output of the EPWM module and the input of the ADC. Notice the changes in the graph window showing the F28377S is running in real-time emulation mode.
In the expression window, I will open the EPWM3 registers to the compare A value. Note, the value is 18750, just as we calculated on the symmetrical PWM computation slide. I will now change the compare A value and watch the effect in the graph window. I have just modulated the EPWM waveform by manually changing the compare A register. Next, in the expression window, I will enable the code in the ADC ISR to automatically modulate the PWM waveform between 10% and 90% duty cycle. This concludes the demonstration of modulating a PWM waveform on the F28377S launchpad. Thank you for watching and I hope this presentation has been beneficial to you.